So now let's take a look at these equations and making these uh, connections between the degrees of the polynomials and what we call the zeros. Now when we say the zeros, what we're really looking at is we're looking at what is the x value when y is zero. So when we say zeros, we're looking to find x when we have y equal to zero. So we make y zero and then we solve for x. So whenever we say we're looking for the zeros, we're looking for the solution to the equation of the x value when we set y equal to zero. So for example, at this first function, the degree here, we have 2x minus 4. The exponent on the x is 1, so the degree here is 1. Remember, this is just a linear one. We haven't actually looked at linear ones on this set of notes yet, but linear functions are technically higher degree polynomials, or they're technically polynomials, low degree. But now let's set y to be 0. So 0 is equal to 2x minus 4. And then now we want to solve for x. So this is just a nice two-step algebra. Add 4 on both sides. That adds to 0. And then we have 4 is equal to 2x. We want to get x by itself. So we divide by 2. And then we get x is equal to 2. So x is equal to 2 is the 0. And so we can say in words that the 0 is at x equals 2. So what that means on the graph is it's exactly the x-intercept, right? We're looking here at the x-intercept when y is 0. That's what it means because we're looking at this point to 0 is how we'd write this point out. And we're saying that x is equal to 2. That is the 0. So we're looking at the x-intercept. And so on this one, the number of zeros, there's just one zero. There's only one solution to this. Sometimes there could be more solutions. And in fact, let's see when there are more solutions. So this next function is degree 2. It's a quadratic, remember. And so we do the same thing we did before. We set y equal to 0. So we have 0 is equal to x squared minus 2x minus 8. And now we want to solve for x. Now here it's kind of difficult to solve for x because we have an x squared here. And we have an x here. So there's some moving parts. We can't just get x by itself because there's different kinds of x's. So there's different ways that we can solve this. We actually did this on the last unit with, with the quadratics where we use the quadratic formula. Another way to do that, if the x values, if the solutions are nice, they will factor nicely. So let's go and have a quick review with factoring. We want to see what two values will multiply to negative 8 that will add to negative 2. And so you can often visualize this as looking at the area of some rectangle where we have the area and we want to know what the side lengths of the area are. So we have the areas, each of these parts here, we have the x squared and then we also have the negative 8. And what we want to find is we want to find what is the other parts in here. What are these side lengths? So we know that to get x squared, you just do x times x. So that's why, remember, when you do factoring, you always write it as x plus or minus something times x plus or minus something else. And so to figure out what that something is, is we have to think about, okay, well, what two things are going to multiply to negative 8, but we want this sum here, we want these two things to add to negative 2. Because when we add the whole area up, we want the area to be the x squared minus 2x minus 8. In fact, it should be negative 2x. And so the idea is here, we think about what two things multiply to negative 8, right? What are 
these two parts that are missing on the side links. And the two parts that are missing on the side links, well, we can think about the factors of negative eight. Well, we have four and two as options. You want to think, okay, well, we want the inside here, that diagonal to add to negative two. So this should be negative four and positive two because that will multiply to negative eight. So then what we have end up here is x times negative four is negative four x and then two times x is two x. So we started with this, these two guys here and we wanted to make sure that what we put on the inside added to negative two x, that middle term. And so this is just a visualization for factoring. So now that we have these two side lengths here, right, this is x minus four and x plus two, we can throw this into how we factor x minus four times x plus two. And we can always double check this if we multiply or distribute the x minus four to the x plus two, we should end up getting the same thing that we started with. So now that we have it factored and it's set e equal to zero, then we can use what is called the zero product rule, which says that if we have two things factored like this, a quantity times another quantity and it's equal to zero, as long as just one of them is equal to zero, then the entire product will be equal to zero. Because if we just find the solution for what would make this first part zero, it doesn't matter what the other part is on the right, the x plus two, if the x minus four becomes zero, well, zero times anything is zero. So then our equation, our solution is satisfied. So let's take a look at the two different solutions that we have. So we have x minus four is equal to zero and x plus two is equal to zero. So we set them each equal to zero. And then we just solve for x. So we just add four on both sides and we end up with x is equal to four. And then we subtract two on the other side and we have x is equal to negative two. So these are our two solutions here. So what that means is that we have two zeros. And we can actually see that in the graph itself, where we have two x-intercepts. So the graph crosses the x-axis twice. So we have two x-intercepts. And these two x-intercepts, in fact, are at negative two, zero, which was the x equals negative two solution. And we have four zero, which was the x equals four solution. And that's essentially what we did, right? We're saying the y value is zero. So what should the x value be? That's how we find x intercepts. So there are two zeros here. Now let's take a look at this next one. This is a cubic, the degree is three. And so to factor this one, to solve for the zeros, this one, we make y zero. So this is zero is equal to x cubed plus three x squared minus four x minus 12. So to solve this one, we do what's called factor by grouping. And the reason why I see this and I know to do factor by grouping or to know to try factor by grouping is that there are four terms. Oftentimes when you have four terms and you're trying to factor, because that's what we want to do to solve we, the X's we want to factor. And so to, to factor this where there's four terms, we can do factor by grouping. Now you may have seen it before. You may not have, we'll walk through it. So we want to do factor by grouping and to factor by grouping. What we essentially do is what we group the, first two terms, and then we group the second two terms. And this is still addition between all the terms, so I'll just put a little addition there. And we want to factor out the greatest common factor in each group. We want to factor greatest common factor from each group. And so what we look at is the first group here. What is the greatest common factor? There's an x cubed here. And then on the other one, there's a three x squared here. So what they have in common are those x's. 
In particular, they have an x squared in common. So we can factor out the x squared. So we have zero is equal to factor out the x squared. See what we have left over. Well, factor out or divide out the x squared from the x cubed, you're just left with x, plus factor out or divide out the x squared from the 3x squared, and you have just three. Plus, now here, we're going to factor out the greatest common factor. So the greatest common factor here, we have a negative 4x is the first term, negative 12 is the second term. So they both have a four as a factor. And in particular, they have a negative four as a factor. So we could actually write this as minus four out here. And so take out the negative four from the negative four X and you're just left with X. Divide out the negative four from negative 12 and you have positive three left over. And then now we actually do the whole factor by grouping again. So we did the factor by grouping or we, we factored out the greatest common factor from these two terms. And now we factor out the greatest common factor from these two terms. Now it looks like there's a lot more terms listed out here, but we actually just have two terms, right? This x squared times the quantity x plus three, that's one term. And then the other term is negative four times the quantity x minus three. So you see we have an x plus three and an x plus three here. So these are what we say are like terms. So because these are like terms, what we can do is that this is the greatest common factor here, right? There's an x plus three as a factor on the first term and x plus three as a factor on the second term. So we can pull out that x plus three out front. So we're factoring out the x plus three. So it comes out front, and then what we have left over, we took out an x plus three from the first term, so we're just left with x squared. We took out an x plus three from the second term, so we're just left with a four. And so this is how we factor this cubic. So we have now x plus three times x squared minus four. And now there's actually two ways that we can go about this because we can still factor x squared minus four even further. We can factor x squared minus four four to be, let's write this out, we have zero is equal to x plus three times. This is what we call the difference of squares. So this is another side note on factoring or just a review on the factoring, the difference of squares. The difference of squares says that if you have an expression or a binomial that's a squared minus b squared, this factors to a minus b times a plus b. And so what that means here on this one, we have the a is the x and the b is the four because four is a perfect square, it's two squared. So this can actually factor to x minus two times x plus two. And now this is all complete factors. So we set it all, each of them equal to zero because there, if one of them is equal to zero, then the entire product is zero. So this is the zero product rule that we were talking about before. And so we have now x plus three is equal to zero, x minus two is equal to zero, and we have x plus two is equal to zero. So to solve, we subtract three on this one and we get x is equal to negative three. On the second one, we add two, so we get x is equal to two. And then on the last one, we subtract two, so we say x is equal to negative two. So here, there are three different zeros that we have. So with the three different zeros that we have, that means that this should correlate to the x-intercepts on the graph. So let's look at the x-intercepts on the graph. Well, if we count over to the left, one, two, three, well, that's an x-intercept of negative three. This is the point negative three, zero, which indeed is the zero of x equals negative three that we found. This other one here, if we count left, that's one, two, that is negative two. So that's the point negative two, zero. And then that 
again correlates to the zero that we have of x is equal to negative two. And then this last one all the way to the right here is the point two zero. And that correlates to the zero that we just found x is equal to two. So what that means here is that we have three zeros. We can find them graphically in the picture on the graph. And then we can also show that or find it algebraically by setting y equal to zero. And so you might be sensing a pattern here and seeing, oh, well, on the first one, we had degree one and one zero. On the second one, we had degree two and we had two zeros. Degree three on the third one and we had three zeros. So you might be thinking, well, the number of zeros is the same as the number of the degree or what the degree is. And that is the pattern that we see, except it's it's there's a little bit more to it because we don't always have exactly that number. We can have at most that number of zeros. For example, if we look at the functions that we started with, notice on the odd or the degree seven one, that is degree seven, but if you count, we only have one zero. We only have one x-intercept. So it's not always like a perfect the one to one, the number of zeros is the same as the degree, but the number of zeros tells us the maximum degree or vice versa. The degree tells us the maximum number of zeros. So the degree of the polynomial tells us the maximum number of zeros. And then the connection that we were just making is that the zeros of the function are also the solution to the related equation and the x-intercepts. So when we say the related equation, that's, that's what we mean by saying set y equal to zero. Um, so they're connected with the x-intercepts on the graph. So on the next one, let's take a look at this. There is a function that is degree three and it's a cubic again, and we want to find the zeros. So we want to set y to be zero. So we have zero is equal to x cubed plus two x squared minus five x minus six. So again, I see there are four terms, it's a cubic. And so we can try what we did on the last one and factor by grouping. So let's group the first two terms and then group the last two terms, and it's technically adding in between those. So we see, we wanna factor out the greatest common factor here. So let's see what, what are the greatest common factors on the first one. It is x squared again, kind of similar to the last one. It's x squared that we can pull out and we are left with x plus two. So we pulled out x squared, or we divided out an x squared from each of these terms and pulled it out front. And then now let's see, we can pull out here um, we, we kind of want the stuff on the inside to match. There's no number factor that works out. We, we could factor out the negative to make it all positive or negative one. So this is five X minus six, but you might notice here that we, we can't go any further. This isn't nice or it's, it's not nice. I should say, because these don't match up. There's nothing that we can, uh, factor out here. Whereas on the other one, if we can like compare or create a contrast, on the other one, when we did the first step, we, common, we factor out the greatest common factor, we had an x plus three left over on both terms. And that was what allowed us to be able to do the factor by grouping nicely. But here, there is no greatest common factor left over after we do the first round of factoring. So there's no match here. So we can't really s solve this algebraically, at least with the tools that we have, but we can look at it graphically. So let's look at these x-intercepts and these are all counting by one on these steps. So this is actually an x-intercept or a zero of negative one and zero. So we actually have a solution here of x is equal to negative one, that's a, it's a zero. Uh, we have another one here, if we count one, two, three, this is the point negative three, zero. So that means we should have a zero of x equals negative three. 
And then the last one here on the far right, there's is one, two. So this is the point two, zero. So that means we should have a solution of x equals two. These are actually nice numbers. So it would make sense that we should be able to write these in a factored way, in a factored form. And so in particular, we can kind of go backwards with knowing what the zeros are to get what the factors are. Because going back, there's this very direct relation or correlation between the zeros and the factors. So looking at this last example, we had uh, the zero of negative three, x is equal to negative three. That was the solution we got in the end, which means we solved the equation x plus three is equal to zero. So that means that we had a factor of x plus three. Same thing with we had a zero of negative two. So we solved the equation x plus two, which means we had the factor x plus two. And so these factors and these zeros are directly related. In fact, it's just sort of like this idea of transformations, right? The inside is always the opposite of what that solution or what the x-intercept is. And so here we can actually list out what the zeros are. I have to shift this up a little bit, give me some space. So we have that the zeros are x equals negative three, and we have x equals negative one, and we have x equals two. So what that means is that we solved the equation x plus three is equal to zero, or we could just do that algebraically. We could just add three on both sides there. And then same thing here, we had x is equal to negative one, but we were actually solving x plus one is equal to zero because we just add one on both sides. And here we were solving x minus two is equal to zero. So we can relate this to those equations that we were solving. And in particular, we're running out of space here, but that means that we had the factors x plus three, and then we also had the factor x plus one, and then we also had the factor x minus Two. So these were the factors that we had to get those zeros of negative three, negative one, and two. And so this is a very key and important fundamental or foundational result in all of these high degree polynomials and looking for zeros and everything. So what that means, so let's first write out this is number of zeros is three. We can see that in the graph and in the degree as well. We can locate the zeros from the graph by finding the x-intercepts because we're, we're essentially kind of working backwards now. We find the x-intercepts. And so once we have the x-intercepts, then we can work backwards. So if we have that x equals r is a zero, if only I could highlight twice, this is the key here. If x equals r is the zero for a polynomial, then we have the factor x minus r. So notice when we put the minus r here, that's saying this is the opposite sign as, as the zero or opposite sign um, of the zero.